Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dagny Corcoran, and this is Art Catalogs. And welcome to uh, our talk with Alex Israel and Jack Benkowski. Um, before we start, I need to tell you um, uh, about the chaos that happens at the end of the uh, the end of the talk, which is when everybody stands up and knocks over their wine glass, and we have to put the chairs to the side to uh, get ready for the book signing. So it takes three minutes, and Daniel and, uh, is really skilled. But if you just will stand um, so that we can clear the chairs at, at the end of the talk, that's all we need to do. And then Alex will um, uh, sign the books, and, and uh, off we go. Uh, we're getting a real pre preview of the new prints that Alex made for Mixographia. They were only released last Saturday. The edition's not, isn't it cool? Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> uh, the edition's not even finished, but the gallery has graciously let me borrow them just for today. I'm really pleased to have them, even if it's just for a few hours. They have to go back to Mixographia to be in the show. <laughs> so, uh, it's hard uh, to introduce Alex Israel. He makes paintings, of course, and sculpture, and also murals and TV shows and films. He has a business that makes sunglasses, and he'll soon have a fashion line. His art seems to be everywhere. Everyone seems to collect it, and everyone seems to have an opinion about it. It was impossible not to notice it when LACMA installed this huge backdrop painting in the hall across from art catalogs. I didn't like it. It had replaced my beloved Lawrence Wiener, and it had, made, uh, it had been made in the scenic art department at Warner Brothers, and I just didn't get it. It seemed cynical. But it's been six months since they took it down, and I've been thinking about it since then, and unbelievably, I have changed my mind. I don't think it's cynical at all. I think it's timely and relevant. I've come to understand that Alex is examining a specific Californian cultural history, reporting on a group of millennials who watch movies on the internet and who lead a particular West Coast version of life where fame and celebrity are extremely important. Alex is making work that is understood by teenagers living in the celebrity culture of Hollywood and Malibu. As a matter of fact, he's just finished a teen surf film and he's been taking it on tour to high schools across the United States. He's been in high school auditoriums all over the place. He is nevertheless influenced by the same things that influenced the artists that I grew up with. Influenced by the Californian impact of light, water, surfboards. I think he's carrying on the tradition of James Terrell, Larry Bell, Craig Kaufman, Joe Good, Billy Al Bankston. All of those artists were cool and radical in the 60s and 70s. Alex is cool and radical 50 years later. I'm very pleased to have Jack Bankowski here as well because he has all the insider information we need about Alex. He is currently at work on The Secret Project, a novella-length memoir of his friendship with Alex. Jack's a critic, curator, and editor-at-large at Art Forum, where he was editor-in-chief from 1992 to 2003. He's the founding editor of Book Forum, an essential resource for those of us in the book business. And I've got copies of his book, Pop Life, the catalog for his exhibition at Tate Modern. He has written extensively on contemporary art, including essays about Richard Prince, Rachel Harrison, and Louise Lawler. He's a faculty member at Art Center and coordinates the MFA seminar program that makes this one look like nothing. He brings distinguished artists, critics, and art historians to the campus there. We're lucky to have Alex and Jack here, and I'm delighted to welcome them to Art Catalogs. Uh, Jack Thanks, Dagny. And, yeah, welcome. Jack and, um, I think, let's hold it up. I think it should be I on. I think it's on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. Thanks, Jack. Okay, let's let's uh, start at the beginning, and I don't mean I won't ask you if you drew as a child. I know you did, but start where you first 
began to constitute yourself as an artist in a more adult, self-conscious way. When I first met Alex, he was still working at uh, Hauser and Worth, the blue chip contemporary art gallery. And he uh, seemed to have a good expense account, and he traveled all over the place. And it seemed like a fantastic job for a young guy in his 20s. But one day, uh, he announced to me that he was going to leave that behind and become an artist. And he thought that the first uh, step in that process should be to pick up a MFA, which he uh, quickly uh, went about doing. And you were worried about me. I, wa I was yeah. a little worried about <laughs> Alex. Um, you know, being an artist, of course, uh, comes with all the glories and immortality, maybe, and all of that stuff. But it's not as uh, reliable a career path as, say, dentistry. And um, of course, the career did take off, as we know. And so it turned out I had nothing to worry about. But um, Alex, uh, can you revisit that moment for us? Um, where were you in your head back then? Was there already the beginning of a master plan? Or was it uh, yeah. just a kind of desire? Um, yeah. I. I guess um, when I met you, I was working for Hauser and Worth. That's right, and um, that sort of happened in a way accidentally. I guess um, I studied art in high school and in college. I was an art major, and um, I worked for artists. And I I wanted to to be an artist, but that's a very scary thing to say out loud that you want to be an artist for the reasons that you just explained. Like it's a very you know. It, it's a questionable, it's questionable sustainability issue, and and, um, and I didn't know, you know, if I could do that and what that would be like, and I wasn't really ready to say, oh, I'm an artist. So um, after college, I decided I would work in the art world and kind of learn about what the art world was like and um, and get to be close to art, but but not yet have to say that I was going to be making it professionally. So I was making it a little bit, um, kind of on the side in secret. And, um, and I was working for museums and for galleries and f for artists. I worked for um, Jason Rhodes very closely. And I even worked at, at Sotheby's Auction House in New York for, in the contemporary art department. But um, when Jason, well, towards the, uh, Towards the end of two years of working with Jason, he asked me if I would work for his gallery, but kind of as his liaison. And his gallery was Hauser and Worth, and I said yes, and I, I just figured things would continue as they had of me working with Jason in this kind of very particular way, but then he died. And, um, and so Hauser and Worth sort of inherited me, and I ended up you know, wearing a suit, standing in the Basel Art Fair booth, selling paintings or trying to and and after a certain at a certain point I was like this where, where, where am I like this is not what I kind of set out to do and um, I decided it was time that was that was a key moment for me and I was like this is really um, the path has gone too far off the plan and I need to go back so I'm gonna go to grad school and I'm gonna commit to this and I also felt at that point that I had learned enough about the art world and kind of what happens to your work after you make it, that I didn't have to feel um, the anxiety of not knowing what that was like, and that I could go and make art and not um, feel like I had this, um, this big anxiety of, uh, of questions about what would happen. Um, so. can, you, can you talk uh, a little bit about some of the first projects I'm thinking of? maybe Freeway, the sunglasses line, and oh, yeah. uh, the mural that uh, announced it. I mean, one thing is you've, you've always worked with objects and scenography. Uh, eventually, that turned into painting and sculpture. But then there's everything else, which I think is all important. And the sunglass line, Freeway, um, I think 
the idea happen early on, maybe when you were still at USC? It, yeah, it actually happened before I went to USC. It happened when I was still working in the gallery. And I was at, um, I was at like a flea market in Zurich and I found this box of sunglasses from like the 90s and the brand was called LA Rays and they were just like dead stock leftover sunglasses and then I went online and I googled this brand and I could find nothing about it and then I went to the trademark website and I found out that the trademark had been abandoned <laughs> so I registered it um, and, and I decided oh well you know this is an interesting name for sunglasses maybe I'll, I'll try this and and I was thinking about, at that point, I was already kind of in the process of applying to graduate school and going back to school and thinking about, well, what kind of artist am I going to be when I get there? Like, what am I going to make? And, and still having lots of anxiety about becoming an artist, mainly because, you know, I had anxiety about making art, artworks, like proper art objects. And so I thought, well, maybe sunglasses is a good way around that. And I can make something that doesn't have to be like a precious thing. And so I started the sunglass business and worked on it all through graduate school. And one of the things, that, another thing that I did early on was I made this web series, a set of videos called Rough Winds that was like a, it was like a, a vehicle for product placement for the glasses. Um, and and that, exists, that would exist ultimately on the internet. And, and so these were the things that I was working on while I was at school. Um, and then I got invited to do like a kind of, um, uh, I had made these collages in school and this curator had seen them, Lori Furstenberg, and she was running LAX Art at the time. And she had been asked to curate um, like a mural at the new Westfield Mall that was opening in um, Culver City, the former Fox Hills Mall, if you're a local. And, um, and so I thought, well, okay, I'll make a mural and I'll just make it about my brand, my sunglass brand. And so that's what I did. And can, you, you brought up your relationship with uh, Jason Rhodes. Yeah. Can you talk uh, a, a little bit about your role in his last, and I think his, his greatest work, the Black Pussy Soiree Cabaret Macrame, and, um, and maybe tell us about the, um, do I have the right term, the pyramid scheme, and uh, what that was about, and, and whether that was art or just, um, canny impresarioship? Oh, well, it was definitely art. Um, so I met Jason Rhodes. Uh, I was introduced to him through one of his other art dealers, uh, David Zwerner. And um, when I left Sotheby's, um, David Zwerner offered me a job at his gallery in New York. And I said, no, I think I'm going to move back to LA, but thank you. And he called me a few months later and said, why don't you, why don't you go meet with Jason? Because he needs somebody to help him with this project, and I think it'd be perfect. So um, I met with Jason, and he had this amazing sculpture that he had built in his studio, which was on Beverly Boulevard in historic Filipino town, just east of Virgil. And it was like this incredible Alibaba's cave of, of junk, but it was very specific junk that he had collected and hunted on eBay and bought in bulk. And he turned all of these objects into this kind of cavernous venue, um, like a venue for, for events, uh, with a stage and a table and a uh, dining area. And, and he needed help kind of activating it. He, he asked me to do that. So he asked me to co-host these events that he was going to, to host in the, in the Black Pussy. And the events were called Black Pussy Soiree Cabaret Macrame. So what Jack mentioned, the pyramid scheme, Jason called the chain letter pyramid scheme. And that was how we were meant to invite people to come. So it was like, you tell one friend, and they tell another friend, and then they tell another friend. And that was the chain letter pyramid scheme. And it sort of worked. <laughs> um, but you we, were unusually good at that part. I was good at wrangling up people and bringing them in and booking the bands. I mean, I didn't know. It was something I'd never done, but it sort of came naturally. And I roped in my friends and my cousin and made everybody help me do this thing. So, Because Jason was a very, very demanding boss. And um, he made you work really, really hard. So we worked really, really hard on it. And I sort of you know, roped everyone in, and we got, we got these parties going. I remember the first party, there were like eight or 10 people, and it was super awkward. 
And then by the last party, we had like 100 people. And it was just like fluid and amazing. And it took about six or eight months to get to that point. And then uh, and tragically, J Jason passed away right at the end of that project. And I have this theory that the chain mail pyramid scheme is the motor of Alex's whole uh, larger project, but I'll spare you that art theory <laughs> now. And instead, um, he, you know, a lot of artists that you admire and that I happen to admire too, beginning with Andy Warhol, make objects, of course, but on the other hand, they <coughs> also do a lot of other things. They manage a whole network of activities, cross-pollinating activities. And um, so um, since I am an art critic, I'm going to read a very um, un-Alex Israel quote that was in the summer issue of Art Forum by um, the Marxist theoretician Benjamin Buchlo. So you'll have to listen carefully. And then I was hoping that I could get Alex to comment on it because I, I think it's um, you know sort of germane to his whole project in a okay. surprising kind of way. So here it goes. Benjamin Buchlo asks, to what extent must the practice of sculpture fracture its former morphological and material homog homogeneity into discontinuous activities in order to credibly claim that sculpture can still initiate some kind of social agency. I know that sounds like um, art criticism, but... Can you, can you read it one more time? I'll give it to you again. Thanks. To what extent must the practice of sculpture fracture its former morphological and material homogeneity in other words, the fact that it was one um, holistic object thing, into discontinuous activities in order to credibly claim that sculpture can still initiate some form of social agency. So in other words, he asks us, is it somehow true that sculpture can't be just sculpture, but has to be embedded in a network of other kinds of activities to be, in fact, credible as sculpture today? So well, I guess, I mean, sure, to a great extent, I guess so many artists work in this way of, what did he say, discontinuous activity? Um, what I don't know is that necessarily they're all doing it to make um, credible sculpture's ability to have social agency, but I don't really understand, taken out of context, what, what do you think he means by social agency? Because that could mean so many things. That could mean so many things, and maybe it, could, could, it be a, could that be turned into a question of what could social agency be for an artist such as yourself? Because I think, obviously, I mean, social agency could be some kind of manifest political activism, but social agency could just be some kind of way of animating or moving through the world. Yeah, I mean, I think that, sure, in, in the broader sense of the idea of social agency, that could apply to my thinking. I mean, I, I just would be happy if some, some people, as a result of seeing my work, you know, wear sunscreen and didn't wear it before, or... <laughs> you know, protect themselves with UV lenses because it's important to protect your eyes. But, I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, th yeah. I think that um, that definitely applies. And I think he's definitely right that artists are working across these discontinuous, um, working in a dis discontinuous activity. And I think sometimes I think maybe we do that not just to prove sculpture's, you know, ability to to have social agency, but we do it because that's how the world has evolved, and that's how we might understand language today, whereas, I don't know if Mr. Bu Mr. Buclo's on Snapchat or not, but like, I think it's important that we make things in different ways and on different platforms to engage with an audience that's, you know, finding its information and its content in so many different and unexpected places. Um, so, I think about using multiple platforms or a kind of discontinuous activity in order 
to reach people and to find my audience. Um, and then if I can impact them you know, to be better, people are more open-minded, that would be great, but um, that would be a byproduct, I guess. Yeah. What would you say your most perfect artwork is? And I, I don't mean you know, most ambitious, or, um, but just the one that maybe sort of fulfills your program in the most, to you, <laughs> adequate way. I it's mean, I know question. that, I don't, you know. I mean, it's a hard question because, um, like, sometimes I think about my, my work as being a you know, a dis discrete group of objects, making one object and then making the next object. And then sometimes I stand back and I think, like, the whole thing is a total work and it's just one thing that I'm making. And, um, and it's, a total, it's a, just a total work. It's one artwork. And I guess if that's true, then that would be my most perfect and my most imperfect, or my favorite and my least favorite. I mean, you know, it, it would represent everything. So maybe it's that. It's a, I don't know. Do you, set, do you set out, though, with, with something in mind? You're talking about social agency and, and uh, wanting to make uh, things better. Do you well, do, th I mean, I mean, do, you do I that uh, consciously? Yeah, well, when I made the movie, I did that. Yeah, I made this movie with the idea that I could embed it with a message that would be positive for, for young people, that they would watch the movie and they could potentially s see it as, um, as an example of how these characters use creativity to kind of find themselves and to find their voices and to make that transition from adolescence into adulthood just like a little bit easier, because it's a tough one. And, and creativity helped me through that, and I think it's a good message. So yeah, so in that sense, I went out on tour and I showed this movie to teenagers in auditoriums and gymnasiums at their high schools, and I said this to them. So in that case, um, yeah, I think that the, the, uh, d uh, the disparate activity was maybe more specifically geared at creating some kind of social agency or... Uh, and, and, but, uh, what, when you had a group of young, quite young, right, 18 year olds in, in an audience... In high schools? Well, it was yeah. like 15 to 18 15 to 18. Yeah. What, you, what did you tell them? Did you, I mean, did you speak as a twice oh. their age? You are. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. But I talked about my high school experience. Uh -huh. And I talked about, um, how I had an art teacher who inspired me and how, uh, you know, that was really a turning point in my life. And, and I showed a lot of art. I, I did a presentation in addition to showing the film. And through that presentation, I kind of talked about, you know, what contemporary art looks like, how it has an expansive definition. And, and, and it was important to me to impart to them that ultimately they get to decide what art will be in the future. So I wanted to let them know that they were enfranchised by it, and that they were a part of it. And, and in some cases, I was in cities where there are no kind of major contemporary art museums, and kids don't have access to go see them all the time. And that was really the point of that project. And, and I loved it. I loved doing it so much that we're planning to do it again in March, I think, and to go out for another two weeks and to go to uh, you know, an, another group of schools and to meet with more kids. And, so that's all in process. We're working that out, but but we, let's, you were going to say something. So I, don't I mean, that, you know, um, you have to use the mic. <laughs> one, one, sorry. Um, you know, one thing about uh, SPF eighteen, the new movie, is um, it, it's interesting to think about. You know, who that movie is aimed at. In a way, it it bypasses. Um, you know, Alex is working inside and outside the art world and some kind of uh, creating some kind of ecology that is the work as a whole. Uh, in this case, the movie really bypasses the art world altogether. I mean, it went right to YouTube and then... No, no, iTunes. iTunes, rather. Yeah. And then uh, on the high school, you know, tour around the country which uh, anticipated its Netflix release. Um, and in a sense, you know, it's, a, 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 it's aimed at a, I don't know if, if many of you have seen it, but it's aimed at a 
young adult audience and it has a little bit of the feel of an after school special you would uh, watch on uh, TV before you did your homework. And <laughs> it's, yeah. and you know, there's the question of um, who, you know, who is this movie for? And, and I think it's interesting because an artist like, um, well, maybe I, no, I should ask you to, to say something about that. Who is it for? Well, it's for everybody, and that includes young people. I mean, my idea of everybody includes teenagers, I guess, and, um, and it was important for me to make something for them. Um, so that's why I made the movie. But, I'm, but a, is it I'm, really a, I'm a teenager at heart, so I think a lot of adults are too, and so it's also for you know, those of us that are still like, kind of stuck in high school. Yes. <laughs> and what about for, you know, uh, so in that sense. Maybe you're stuck in high school. For the, uh, <laughs> or, or maybe. I, I have another idea about it. I think a little bit, again, uh, you know, it's back to Andy Warhol, but of course he did all kinds of things, everything imaginable in addition to uh, making his, you know, famous iconic paintings. And, um, but he always somehow, ins you know, he always insisted that it be finally, you know, under the sign of art, that everything took its meaning because it was somehow, you know, bracketed um, under the idea of art. Otherwise, it would have just been a TV art, and a TV ad, or, 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 or whatever, or a mm -hmm. social rag, or, a, you know. Or, or a sunglasses line. Or a sunglasses but, line. But I'm totally fine with my sunglasses line just being sunglasses. Um, in fact, I say that it's not an, an artwork. Yeah, so. I mean, I think it's okay if things aren't always art. They don't have to be. And, um, and that's okay. But I think the power of your art tr trades on that reciprocity. I think one wouldn't mean the same thing. The paintings wouldn't mean the same thing without the sunglasses and vice versa. Not that the sunglasses would have to because one doesn't have to dignify sunglasses by being works of art. <laughs> one has to dignify works of art by having sunglasses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's, well, Duchamp said you could have a work of art just because he said so. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the... Well, that's kind of always been the great power since Duchamp, is that artists can anoint anything as an, as an artwork. And um, I think maybe sometimes people rely on that too heavily. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can chill out a little bit and not everything has to be art all the time. So. Are, are you going to do a fashion line? Clothing line? Maybe, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Do you want to? Did you want to ask me about? I think I think maybe he wanted to ask oh, me sorry. about. That. Well, I okay. I probably would ask it just like that. Yeah. Um, it's actually funny that we're we're doing this talk together, and you and you ask that question because um, Jack taught me a word that I didn't know a few years ago. Do you want to teach everyone here what that word about that word? <laughs> and it, that's the in the mic. In the mic. Way yeah you know, way ba way back when when Alex was um speculating about uh, having a denim line. I don't know if that's, you'll have to tell us how the clothing line has evolved, but years ago, Alex, uh, I don't know whether he was planning or just sort of riffing at that point, but talked about a line of denims, and I said, um, the line should be called, infra, the jeans should be called infrathins. And that, as you know, well, you tell them what the term means. So it's a word that, that is an English translation of a French word, inframer, which was invented by Duchamp. And it essentially means like the, in, the indefinable or indeterminate difference between two things that are exactly the same. Right? Yes, so the difference between... Between like this urinal and that urinal. And genes... Or these jeans that I'm... And jeans that are art. No, <laughs> and then but are really jeans. just jeans. Right. That's so, the so that's the brand name. So I registered the trademark for Infrathin. And um, I'm working on some products. And they'll be coming soon. And um, 
yeah. That's it. I'm working on it. And it's all going to be made in Los Angeles. And um, I'm very excited to share it with you soon, but not, not quite yet. So we're gonna, yeah, maybe next year. Infra, like infrared, thin, like skinny. And I like that it sounds kind of like a technical fabric, or it sounds like a weird diet plan, and people aren't going to know what it means, so they're going to have to Google it, and then they're going to read this thing about Duchamp and the difference between two things, and they're going to go, what? But I, I don't know, I kind of, it, it sounds just kind of good. It, it has a nice of, ring. Yeah. For jeans. Yeah. So but, yeah, so first t-shirts, then jeans are really complicated. So we're going to start with t-shirts and we're going to work our way to jeans, one thing at a time. Yeah. So since my um, big a, 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 you know, critical agenda here is obviously that we're not to just think about the objects in and of themselves, but we have to think of them in, in terms of this ecology that includes the um, sexy infra-thin jeans. The, you know, maybe a good question, um, rather than asking about another body of work, is to ask about uh, Alex's backlot, Warner Brothers studio. Um, can you, for people who haven't visited, can you tell them how that happened and what it is and how it works for you? Yeah, so um, I was making my uh, talk show, As It Lays, um, and I needed a big painted backdrop for the set. And I just didn't, I, you know, I just, I just Googled. And I found a few places that made backdrops. And one of them was Warner Brothers. So I went over there, met with them, and um, asked if they could do this big sunset sky backdrop. And they said, sure. And I showed them a picture kind of what I had in mind. And they were so nice. They were like, yeah, we could do this for you. And, um, and they did a great job. And I was really very happy working with them. And they were so easy to work with it. I came back and I said, well, could you guys help me make this other thing? And they were like, oh, yeah, sure. And, and, and it turned into this ongoing dialogue and relationship. And um, it was really serendipitous that when I asked them, they had just kind of bought these massive new printers. And the whole uh, idea of scenic art was really changing. And things were being printed for the backdrops of TV shows and movies and not necessarily hand painted anymore and and there was a moment in time where they had like 20 or 30 scenic painters full time and at this point they had whittled it down to just one and a half one and a half and one full time and one part time and and so this guy was there and he had this amazing knowledge and um, skill set that really wasn't being utilized at all I mean, he was like pushing the print button, and and he could you know paint these amazing backdrops, and so it worked out really well. They were so happy to have him painting. He was so happy to be painting again, and and they had this crazy space, <laughs> which is this you know huge space for painting backdrops, and it just kind of all worked out so that I could I kind of moved in, kind of took over that department, and um, have been working there ever since. And it's been kind of an amazing, an amazing lucky situation. Yeah, and you have to uh, you have to imagine um, going on a studio visit to a young artist studio, and you uh, get a Warner Brothers pass, and um, then go into these giant uh, cavernous uh, backlot movie warehouses. It is just you know, suffice to say, sort of perfect for um, Alex's art, and became a kind of. Um, perfect performance and a perfect place to obviously bring people to uh, initiate him to. Yeah, it's Alex's fun. World. It's really fun. And people sometimes ask me when they come, like, if this is all some kind of critique of Hollywood or something. And I always say the same thing, which is that I just wanted to be really close to it. Like, I wanted to be right there where they make the magic. And hopefully, maybe if I was lucky, that some of that stardust or that magical quality would sort of rub off on what I do uh, and kind of embed itself into, into my work. I mean, that would, be, that would be great if that happened. So can I, can I ask you how many uh, social events you <laughs> attend a week? 
I think that you're oh, wow. sort of catching up with Henry James, who I think in the, what, what was the social season? It was, I think, 1878, 1879, when dined out 140 times. Um, oh, I I'm definitely sure beat him. I'm sure you beat him, <laughs> but I think you're, pro you're probably closing in on Andy, too. I mean, I usually, like, in an, av an average week, I probably go out five or six nights a week uh, to different events. But the clincher is it's usually three things a night. Sometimes it's multiple things a night, yeah. Actually, it's not, not uncommon. But I, I'm social. I like it. And I find it really stimulating, and I find that I learn a lot. And um, I, I think of it as part of my, my practice, part of my work, especially since... Um, I, I kind of sometimes imagine using certain uh, kind of LA people as, as material in my work. I have to go out and kind of harvest that material. And um, yeah, it's just, it's part of the work. It's called the pyramid scheme. It's the pyramid, chain letter pyramid scheme. Um, so um, maybe, we, I don't know how long we should few more minutes. Um, maybe we should talk about the Oscar show um, okay. that you did with Brett Ellis. And uh, can, would you say it was a collaborative work between obviously a you know, great novelist and yourself? Or um, was it an epic performance that it uh, might possibly even be too um, impolitic to unpack here? So it has to be one or the other? <laughs> I mean, no, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing. That, that's sort of something that the art world likes to do, right? Is to divide things into two categories. And something's either made you know, for the marketplace and, or something's made for the, 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 the critical establishment. Or artists sort of have to fall into one of two categories. And I don't know. I just don't think about it like that. And... And when I was thinking about working with Brett, I was really thinking about something else entirely, which is, which is impact, I guess, like another category that, um, that might not be something that we think about that, that often in, in, in the art world. And, um, and how many times could we get these images reproduced? Or how many times could we get them Instagrammed? And how many times could we get them... Um, to be discussed at a dinner or something after, after the show opened. And, um, and I think that's an entirely kind of different way of thinking about what those things are. Um, and, and I'm more comfortable thinking about them in that way. And um, I wonder, is that a good place to, to close it down? Or do you want to talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about um, social media media as an art medium and or anyway the way you use social media how many instagram followers do you have at this point um i have like close to to 80,000 followers i was really lucky because in the early days of instagram they made me a suggested user for like 2 weeks and all these people who were downloading the app it would tell them to follow me and so i got like i don't know 50,000 followers and like in like two weeks, but um, but no, I use Instagram, you know, as a tool to kind of promote certain things, like this talk. I don't know if any of you saw that I posted about it on Instagram. Did you see that, Dean? No. I wondered if that's why you were here, but. And then. <laughs> oh yeah, we're friends. We're real friends in in real IRL. Um, but but um, no, I think um, yeah, it's a great tool just to communicate and put things out there uh, when you want to make people aware of a project or an event or something that you're doing. Um, so that's kind of mainly how I use it. Yeah. I, um, I'm going to have to close, uh, oh. close you down a okay. little bit. Do you want to have one more? Jack, do you have one more? Anything you want to? Do we have time for two or three questions from sure, the audience? Sure, yeah. Okay. We, uh, is there a, anyone in the audience with a question? Oh, yeah, okay. Let, let me bring you the microphone. Okay. Uh, 
Hi, you guys. I, I, I saw it on Instagram, but I also got an, uh, an email from Dagny. So, oh, so. cool. And Jack told me about it, too. <laughs> IRL. Cool. So, okay, my question is something that I think you've been skirting around, and Jack seems to, you know, look back to Andy Warhol, but I'm wondering if you're the, the artist of the disruptive economy. So, like, you know, there's Uber that took over taxi cabs, and that the fact that you understand how the whole functioning of the art world works, that you've sort of disrupted it in, in order to, you know, to have this other economy and to make things, you know, by working with Jason, by being at Hauser & Wirth, by being at, did you say Sotheby's? Or I was even, yes, I even worked at Sotheby's. In a, so yeah. you saw how things sort of happen and that even bef you know, you made art to kind of bypass all of this so that you could then jump into it. Anyway, either one of you, both of you can comment. That sounds more like a, like a comment, right? No, it's a qu oh, question. Do you agree or not, or not? Do I agree? What do you think, Jack? I sort of agree. <laughs> I mean, I really love art and art history and contemporary art, and it's not something I would really want to dis disrupt. Um, I like it. I mean, I, th I like going to coming to LACMA and looking at things here in, in the galleries and thinking about them. And um, But I do think that there are a lot of people out there that, that don't live in a city like L.A. that don't have access to like a place like LACMA that are hungry and interested in, uh, hungry for and interested in art. And um, there's other ways of reaching them. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and, and to kind of make things that can exist in channels that are easily accessible for people uh, outside of you know, a place like LA where we're so lucky that we get to come and look at things in the flesh whenever we want, amazing things. Okay, hold it, here's another. Hi, Alex. Um, Hi. I saw your show at the uh, Gagosian, oh, cool. the one he was talking about, and um, you just mentioned how you like to be close to Hollywood and you know the whole star system, but at least my take on it was there was a lot of irony in, in that show, in the, in the quotes, and I found it, funny in a good way, ironic, and uh, so that's a little bit different from what you just said. So am I right in the irony or not? You were more wholehearted when you were doing those. Well, no, I mean, uh, in, in, I think of that work and um, both Brett, my collaborator, and I are from Los Angeles. And we've both chosen to be here, to live here, because we love this city. And, and there are things about this city that are strange and weird and, you know, Negative, but they're all part of this city that we love. So, that show, I think, I think maybe, you know, of course, I'm happy for anyone to interpret it however they want. But for me, it's really a, like a love letter to Los Angeles and to this culture um, that we have here. That's so so interesting to me. Okay. Well, um, just a f one more or two more. I miss the mixographia. Uh, show. Oh, well, but it's behind, right behind. I it. saw, yeah. but I was I interested in what made you decide to work with them and do the collaboration. Obviously, many artists have worked with them, but just curious. Well, I mean, I, it, you know, a lot of the way I think about my paintings I isn't necessarily, I don't think about them really always in two dimensions. I think about them more as objects, like, like, uh, like a backdrop is an object. And um, my self portrait paintings are kind of like signs. And I wanted to make prints, um, but I didn't want to just, you know, um, you know, f uh, lose that object quality um, to the works. So Mixographia is this amazing place where the, I don't know if you're all familiar with it, but they have a patented technology where they can use paper to make really um, impressive reliefs out of paper and out of prints, and so. I worked with them to make these works using that relief technique so that the, the prints are more like little miniature signs or little objects, like the way that I make the, the larger ones. Um, and it was a, it, it, I'm really happy with how it, it all worked out. They were 
so great to work with. And, and the, yes, there's a show, and it's up at their workshop. Um, and it's downtown, and I think it's up until Dece uh, middle of December. Um, One, was there one more? Okay, okay, just let me bring you the microphone and then we'll have to stop. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Um, big, big fan of your work. Brilliant. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, really, um, I really like, like the way um, you kind of translate, you know, like the work, like, how uh, it really feels like West Coast. And I remember when you even just doing uh, some of your like, uh, your eyeglass collaboration, like even naming them after like LA freeways, um, uh, is very West Coast. I, I, I guess my question is what, um, now that you're kind of exploring more into like uh, producing like uh, t-shirts and uh, jeans, like what would be some of your like ideal like brands for collaborations that like you feel like would connect uh, with, you know, just the idea of? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to, I can't, I can't tell you, but we are planning some exciting collaborations with LA brands um, for, for 2018. Um, but they're, the two brands that I'm um, working with are both LA based brands that have a strong identity uh, th th that's kind of connected to Los Angeles and to the city. So um, I, I wish I could tell you, but we can't yet <laughs> tell you, so yeah. Okay, now, um, here comes the chaos. We're going to thank you, gentlemen. Uh, okay, that thank was you. fabulous. <laughs>